Hello, Sword Dude and Dudettes. Boy, am I lucky today. I get to show you another Albion, and this is probably the prettiest sword that I have reviewed in quite a while. This is the Albion Kern. So we have an arming sword, and this specific one is a sword that comes from the 16th century. So the blade is an oak shot type 19 blade, and it's unique in that it has a very distinct type of hilt. This type of hilt is uh, characteristic of those found on Irish swords from the 16th century or so. So everyone uh, will recognize these kind of open wheel or ring hilted pommels. There were ring pommeled swords in other parts of Europe and certainly in other places around the world. But these ones are uh, very characteristic of swords that were found in Ireland, however, not throughout all of Irish history. So if we look in the medieval period, from the 10th through maybe 14th century, swords in Ireland are very similar to swords seen in the rest of the continent. Starting in the 15th century, you have swords that are more uniquely Irish, although they share a lot in common with Gaelic swords found, for instance, in Scotland. And then by the time you get to the 16th century, you have very heavily localized Irish swords. Now, that said, a lot of the blades at this point are not being made locally in Ireland, so they're being exported, uh, or I should say imported, from other uh, mass-manufactured blade centers. So this is very common. So throughout the medieval period, while you can have a local blacksmith producing swords for the local common uh for the for the local populace and local local consumption the 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 very famous blade centers toledo paso uh, solingen they were making blades for export all over the place that were then being hilted in the local fashion and so that's what we find we'll find a sword in ireland that was made in germany and then hilted in the local style to accommodate the local Irish fashion. So why is this of note? This sword handles kind of unusually. And when you have a, a reproduction sword that handles a little oddly, you immediately kind of check one of two different things. Did the designer not know what they were doing? Or did the company have like a batch that went out improperly? Well, this was designed by Peter Johnson, who is one of the most well-respected researchers and bladesmiths that's currently living. And it was produced by Albion, who is one of the most consistent of any of the manufacturers out there. So neither of those are really the case. This is actually a very, very faithful design. Uh, this is very, very faithful to the original designs. But what feels unusual about it? Compared to other arming swords, this has tremendous blade presence. So it's not the longest of all arming swords. It's about 33 inches, 85 centimeters. So it's quite long. But it tends to want to dip in the hands. There's not a lot of mass back here. It doesn't have a tremendous amount of mass in the pommel here to counteract that. And as a result, it kind of wants to sit forward. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? So I'm always excited, especially whenever I encounter, for instance, an antique that doesn't sit in my hand the way you would kind of intuitively think of how the sword is going to do that, because that immediately starts to uh, suggest to me that the sword is telling me something about how it wants to be used. And in this case, I can't just pick it up and use it the way that any of my other arming swords that have a big heavy pommel and a shorter sword and have a balance point closer to the, to the grip are going to be used. So this sword was meant to be used in a certain way. Now, I mentioned that it's a Type 19, and I mentioned that its blade is exported from somewhere else in a different part of the continent because... If we look at other Type 19 swords, this is a reproduction from swordmaker L.K. Chen. This is the Ribaldo. So this is an Italian Type 19 sword. It balances quite a bit differently. And interestingly enough, even though it still has a lot of blade presence, you'll notice that in this case, there's a fingering suggesting that they were already starting to think about these blades being long and heavy and requiring a finger to be used over the guard and have um, more emphasis on point control. So we're starting to see kind of the genesis of where maybe things like side sword and rapier fencing come from, where there's less of the hammer grip and less of swinging um, from, from the elbow. 
and starting to get the the uh, the point of the sword to go forward the, as as we see the Italian sword play uh, develop throughout the 15th and 16th century. However, it still has a little bit of a pommel to, to counteract it, so it balances slightly different than the, the, the kern. I've seen other people do the same thing with the kern, and the kern does have the big flat ricasso here to be able to put your finger over the quillon um, in order to engage a finger. If I do that, it suddenly feels a lot more nimble and comfortable to hold. Was that what we were doing? Possible. Now, writers of the time mention that when they travel to Ireland, that the people of the island know nothing of fencing, nothing of the swordplay that's going on on the continent during the 16th century. That suggests that they were not practicing point-forward sword work, and they were still taking very large sweeping cuts. And this sword actually does perform that quite well, because it has such a big heavy blade but it means that it's slower and it'll need to be used with a shield in order to do that, which is the type of warfare that the Irish were practicing. So we can go out and we can, we can perform some of that. Now, in my previous video where I was reviewing Albion, I had mentioned that many people will at times criticize Albion for the edge that is put on it. And I defended them saying that many of the swords I've received from Albion are perfectly sharp and perfectly good at cutting. This is going to be an exception to that. This sword, while it does have an edge on it, I have um, tested from, from a cut or two before that it is really not quite sharp enough for the typical backyard cutting. It doesn't quite want to bite most of the targets, and it just needs the kind of final honing in order to be able to cut through the targets very efficiently. This is not my sword. This is a, a friend's sword who I'm going to ship it out to as soon as I'm done with this video. And so because of that, I'm not going to do any final sharpening to the edge. It's really going to take, you know, eight minutes on a stone or three minutes on an electric grinder to bring it up to razor sharp, and then it's just going to sail through the targets. So when we take it over to the target cutting, I'm only going to do a little bit of target cutting because it's not in the perfect state to be able to take advantage of it. But even in its less than perfect state, let's see what it can do. So I'm going to start against a light target, and I will use the finger over the, uh, the grip. I'll use the finger over the guard grip. Not too shabby. I had to swing a little hard in order to get it to go through, and one or two of the cuts were a little ragged. But still, pretty clean, pretty effective. For comparison, here's the LK Chen Ribaldo with a very sharp edge. Quite sharp. Against a thicker target, we'll try a hammer grip.
Well, we exploded the bottle, but didn't quite cut through that one. Lighter target. No problem. Water bottles, okay. A lot of people don't distinguish between a water bottle and a pop bottle or a soda bottle. Soda bottles tend to be quite a bit thicker, so keep that in mind. That uh, Choose your, your cutting medium. Okay, so as I mentioned before, I'm not doing a lot of cutting with this because the, uh, the edge that's on it right now is not going to be representative of the sword model as a whole. I think that that's probably unique to this specific one that I got, that it could be a little bit sharper. But on the whole, it is still a very fun sword. It's light and nimble. It's a bit lighter and uh, nimbler than the Ribaldo, even though, again, it feels a little bit different than most typical arming swords. But this is a representative of a group, again, it's named after the Kern, which were the kind of light warriors from uh, the light infantry from Ireland uh, over the entirety of the medieval period. And uh, it's just an absolutely gorgeous sword. Love the blue, the blue uh, grip wrap that's on it, the uh, sweeping shape of the guard, the, uh, the detail work here in the fullering and on the Ricasso block. This is a spectacularly executed sword. Albion once again has knocked it out of the park and it's a pleasure just to be able to have the chance to, to take a look at it. Um, we'll do some glamour shots so that you can get up close and personal, see how the peen block has been executed, see how the, the ring is, is done, see how all of these risers are all in place. Everything feels really good in the hand. All of the uh, edges are nice and rounded off. Everything feels wonderful. Even putting the finger here on the Ricasso is a very comfortable experience, so I don't have to worry about it catching against anything hard. I could keep that there all day, and that's not going to ever feel like I'm catching or rubbing against anything sharp. So this is a really neat experience for a very kind of long choppy um, type of longsword at the very end of the uh, arming sword uh, lifespan, just as we're transitioning into the Renaissance and the era of uh, side sword and rapier. Albion Kern, beautiful example. Until next time, guys. Take care.